Alright, welcome back and this is where we pick our discussion and of course my guests are already in the studio that is Anne Gadirwa, technology and data privacy uh, lawyer. Then we have Alan Kakai, director policy and regulation, blockchain association of Kenya. Uh, lady and gentlemen, thank you so much for making time. And uh, of course before we kick start this um, you know, discussion, I want us to take a look at the data uh, protection act that is the purpose of the uh, the act is to give effect to article 31 clause c and d of the constitution which guarantee the safety of every person uh, and of course the safety of every person right to privacy of our information relating to their family or private affairs and their communication. And of course, there is reason why, or rather the purpose why this act was enacted. And of course, one of the you know reasons, or rather the purpose that this act was enacted, one of them is of course to give light to you know the this article 31 of the constitution but to be more precise this is to inform uh, of the use of which the personal data is to be put the objective to process uh, all or of course all of part of their personal data uh, correction of false or false or misleading data and of course um, deletion of false or misleading misleading data about them well there is um, another part of it that is the right of the data subject that is you you and i as a person well you have a right to be informed of the use to which their personal data is to be put to the objective of pro uh, processing of all or part of their personal data, correction of false misleading data, and deletion of false or misleading data. There is cases of exemptions where the part, this is part 7 of the Act, section 51, and uh, of course 50, 51 to 55 of the Data Protection Act, which provide for exemption from the Act in the event of the data necessary for, of course, for national security, and where the disclosure is required to, um, is required under any written law or an order of the court, and the event of prevention or detection of crime, that is the only instant where this act is exempted. Well, so what is prohibited under this act? Of course, the act prohibits cross-border transfer of personal data and we'll take a look at that just to get a brief understanding of what it entails uh, and of course except where there is proof of adequate data protection to safeguard our consent from the data subject well it has been quite um, a busy week as far for Kenyans of course as raised for this uh, free 7,000 shillings is concerned but there has been some you know genuine concern if you ask me uh, from the government and even some of kenyans and this begs the question just how safe is our data out there i'll start with you alan how safe is our data generally or mm -hmm. in regard a lot of things have been happening make no mistake recently we had um claim of you know, cyber attack and some anonymous, anonymous people were trying to hack into government, uh, you know, a database. Of course, claims that were uh, refuted and the government say we have a strong database and there is nothing like that that, um, you know, people, yes, they tried but did not manage to hack. Well, and that comes and this, the world can come at the backdrop of, you know, you know, we just have recently uh, such claim of attack, and now we have database, and the government is say, saying, well, this might be a good idea, yes, but just how safe is the data that is being collected outside there? That is the reason why it led to this suspension pending investigation. So, yeah, how answer, is our data? To answer your question, first of all, this this phrase in the tech world we use, data is the new oil. So, I mean, before the scramble for data, there was scramble for oil, gold, and all that. All right. So right now, there's a very big scramble for data. So how safe is our data? It depends on whose hands it is being held. So for instance, if we started uh, with the, the recent breach you just mentioned, 
uh, the government. Is that safe? They indicated that it's safe, but the only way you can be guaranteed by that is probably if they produce cyber security and penetration testing results to guarantee the safety of data. Because the only way you can guarantee safety of data is actually provide reports, audited reports, indicating that this data is actually safe. So with respect to WorldCoin, their argument on the safety of data is that they have an open source uh, protocol, which has been audited by several institutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe the reason for the freeze for the government is also to provide government and local forensic and cyber security or, or, or auditors or forensic mm -hmm. experts to audit the WorldCoin, WorldCoin's uh, open source protocol and understand that whatever they're doing, whatever data they're collecting is safe enough for them to continue with their activities. All right. So safety of data lies with the guarantee of these uh, cyber security audits and uh, forensic reports. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, and there is um, when actually uh, in regard to this uh, wild coin, first of one of the requirement here, you have first you have to you know give your full names, something like that, your email address, your phone number, and um, there is where they ask you to you know allow access to your contacts that is contact address well these are very sensitive information if you ask me do you think the move by the government to some extent actually um you know could of course you know prevent kenyan in the even, uh, eventuality of what could have you know occurred in terms of um, uh, you know too much information too much sensitive data out there at the hands of a private entity that by the way um the government has said this um, this this company in particular did not register it's not registered here in kenya and of course we'll talk about how can a company uh, operate in kenya obtain data from a kenyan citizen without being registered but first do you think the move was fine the move to stop WorldCoin from operating in Kenya is one that requires a lot of stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. It requires conversations between WorldCoin themselves, the people from whom they are collecting this data from, and the government regulators, mm -hmm. because there is an imbalance of knowledge between the persons who they are collecting this data from and the company themselves. And the data that they are collecting is sensitive personal data that could be used for several purposes. However, the company claims that the data is delinked from the data subject. And so it is on the blockchain, you're not fully, you cannot be linked back to the person who was, it was collected from. Mm -hmm. And so there is need for communication and understanding between the stakeholders. However, whether I support it or the banning, for now, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. There needs to be more investigation into the technology that is being used both the hardware and the software, and then can be able to find out whether or not mm -hmm. the company should continue to operate in our jurisdiction. All right. Well, does it bother you? Because this is a company that has been under investigation. Uh, we have uh, countries like Germany, we have France, we have United Kingdom, then India still raising such concern. Does it raise, you know, questions over its, you know, intention? Because if if a country like Germany France can raise those questions and uh, and they are still under investigation and such you know looming question have not been addressed don't you think uh, it's something that um, you know raise some sort of red flag okay so while going coming into the market states that they want to create a mechanism through which you can disseminate universal basic income which seems to be a very novel and noble idea Mm -hmm. which is even the poorest of the poor, people who are far flung, people who are outside of the regular financial system can mm -hmm. have access to funds. Mm -hmm. The purpose of collection and the method of collection is what is raising a lot of red flags for people. And so if we can be able to look at the technology, we can look at the hardware, we can look at the software, the mm -hmm. orb, once you have been able to scan your iris, your face, your body mapping, where does that information go? Mm -hmm. When you read their white paper, when you read um, their consent forms, it says that that data is delinked from the data subject. It moves on and it is stored primarily in the orb until it moves as, uh, as an encrypted code mm -hmm. into their system. So I would not write them off right now. Okay. However, 
there is need for them to do a lot of public education, for them to lie us with stakeholders so that we can be able to understand the system and we can be able to understand how exactly they are collecting and what exactly they are collecting. All right. Well, um, Alan, who is responsible, of course, for you know, granting permission for such a company to operate in Kenya? That's a very interesting question. I was actually having a discussion with Anne behind the scenes on that because mm -hmm. um, uh, you've taken us through Article 31 of the Constitution and through the Data Protection Act, which sets up an office called the Office of Data Protection Commissioner. Mm -hmm. So the Office of Data Protection Commissioner is uh, the office responsible for protecting personal data. Mm -hmm. Personal data by mean by this I mean data of individuals, you, myself, and every other person in the studio, mm -hmm. not institutional data. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, to this extent, the office issues a data controller license and a data processor license. And interestingly, WorldCoin uh, went through the audit process by, before the launch, mm -hmm. and uh, the commissioner issued them with both licenses. And interestingly, if you did a search just before their launch on the portal, you would see them as a registered entity. So any person who is coming to collect and process personal data within Kenya's jurisdiction is responsible for, um, uh, is uh, subject to o ODPC's mandate and is required to have those two licenses. But this uh, incident has just shown us that actually the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary for Interior can veto the decision of the ODPC because from the text of the act you'll notice that um, it, the act made it look like the ODPC has ultimate power to issue and revoke data processing and data controllers license. But uh, the issue of national security usually takes precedent over any other issue. Mm -hmm. So when it gets to a point where something is an issue of national security, where the ODPC has allowed you to operate, but the CS of Interior feels like they're not confident with security, they can also have a security oversight mm -hmm. to that extent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, today government issued you know a statement saying that um, you know Altcoin is operating illegally in Kenya. Well, you have taken us through the process. Who is responsible for you know giving license? So between you know the body that um, is mandated to issue the license and the government, so who is lying and who is fooling who? And yeah. Uh, just once, uh, you've, you've noticed that there has been a lot of push and pull between government regulators on the issue of WorldCoin. Okay. The first statement that was issued last week, Friday, at around 1, 1, 1 p.m., was issued by Ms. Kasait herself, the Data Protection Commissioner, mm -hmm. and her position at that, on that day was very passive. She did not take the stance that WorldCoin is illegal, mm -hmm. and to some extent it implied that she acknowledged the operations, and that same day I did a search and noted that WorldCoin has both licenses. Then later on, so CS of ICT, CS OALO, who still uh, validated and said uh, WorldCoin is doing well. These concerns have only come in when the interior security has started, CS for interior started raising concerns. Mm -hmm. So terming it illegal, that's a very strong uh, accusation. Let's just say they were operating and uh, to the extent that reg some regulators were not comfortable with specifically interior security, and there is need for further interrogation mm -hmm. and audit, but they were not acting illegally. They were well licensed to operate within the country, mm -hmm. and they were licensed by the ODPC, and even the CS4ICT himself acknowledged. It's just a matter of interrogating and understanding what mm -hmm. exactly they're doing from a security perspective. All right. Well, um, and I want to read to you, you know, the reason why Minister of Interior uh, actually, you know, suspended this. Well, part of the reason was security and protection of the data collected and how the collector intend to use the data is not clear. That is one of the things. Then there is inadequate information on the cyber security safeguard and, of course, the placing of larger data in the hands of private business. Well, you know, you understand what is happening here. And uh, this is a very sensitive information as far as uh, you know, the Data Protection Act is concerned. And then I want to get your attention on this, um, you know, the, the, the part that, uh, you know, what is prohibited, and this is the, um, the cross-border transfer. Uh, based on your knowledge, could you, you know, you know, keep us to date on what is happening, how, under which circumstances is uh, this uh, border transfer is prohibited 
and under what you know special circumstances it's allowed because according to my understanding this is um, a foreign company of course obtaining Kenyan's data but nobody's nobody really knows where these are the information of this data that they collect will be used now you see where there is contradicting information so from legal perspective put us to speed with this Okay, so a cross-border data transfer is where data moves from Kenya, our mm -hmm. jurisdiction, into another country, another country's jurisdiction. It's something that happens often, mm -hmm. all the time. Whenever you log into an app, whenever you use a website, mm -hmm. most of the time those servers are not inside our country. They're usually in another country, and that is where a cross-border data transfer occurs. Mm -hmm. The Office of the Data Protection Commissioner is supposed to look at the data protection laws in that other country and determine whether our data is safe there because that is a form of data processing and storage, collection, alteration of any kind is a form of data processing. Mm -hmm. and that is something that happens when that information is across the borders. And so um, there are risks that are associated with cross-border data transfers. Okay. And those risks are supposed to be assessed and the government is supposed to determine whether that jurisdiction is safe. So, um, in regards to this information being with WorldCoin, their data processing is happening in other countries. It's happening in the United States, in Germany, in the UK, in mm -hmm. Japan, and in India. Now, some of those jurisdictions have a threshold as high as ours when it comes to data processing, that is mm -hmm. Germany and the United Kingdom, mostly because they use a regulation that is similar to ours, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. Mm -hmm. However, when the processing goes to America, it goes to Japan, it goes to India, questions arise as to how safe our data is. And that's where the Office of Data Protection Commissioner is supposed to look at it and determine is the protection in the processing in those countries adequate. Mm -hmm. Up until this point, the ODPC gave them a data control and data processor license. That means that it had gone through and looked at the processing that's happening and determined that it is fine. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Have to leave it at that well, um, I'm I'm looking at uh, you know uh, this the other uh, you know circumstances under which it's you know at least allowed when you give your, your consent. Well, um, I'm not sure if Kenyans actually uh, know what they are signing up for, especially when it comes to this. Like um, you just um, you go there, you put your details out there, but you don't know uh, this. Do you think under this pro provision, this one uh, that prohibit you know cross-border transfer of data, do you think probably this company is breaching that uh, prohibition that uh, is um, you know enacted in this act? Yeah, just to top up to one another, uh, as mentioned, you know when you're going to apply for this data protection mm -hmm. processor license and this data control license, we just don't walk in and the DPC hands you the license. Mm -hmm. It's a rigorous, intense process. Okay. So all those things that C. S. Kindiki is mentioning in his memo, and I appreciate he's looking at it from a security perspective, but they were done. There's something called a data protection impact assessment mm -hmm. that was conducted. You'll be asked questions like, are you transferring this data? Where are you transferring it to? So by the time they were getting that license, mm -hmm. all these concerns that are being raised on that memo mm -hmm. were asked and addressed, and even from her first, uh, from her first response. Hang, you know, hang on just a minute. Well. There is no clear communication as to where this data, of course, uh, is going and how it, it's being stored and how it will be used. Yes. That must be clear. Yeah, what I'm saying is that um, I've done a, a lot of registration for data protection, a lot of clients, and that question is usually asked. Of course, mm -hmm. from the public, probably you don't know. But if you go back to the form they filled while applying for the license, okay. they disclose that to the ODPC. All right. That is something they disclose to the ODPC. And so the issue here is uh, really, let's just say somebody was not doing their job right. right. Somebody did not ask enough questions at the point of registration. Okay. And that is why we have all this conflict between government offices. So in as far as transfer is concerned, mm -hmm. as uh, Anna has mentioned, uh, transfer was disclosed to the DPCs and she was satisfied with the safeguards put in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gave them the license. And one thing about transfer is we need to know that uh, WorldCoin is not the first company doing data transfers globally. All these other tech companies have their servers outside Kenya. As long as you satisfy the need for transfer, which is okay. 
you've put in enough safeguards, okay, okay, then you okay. can proceed with the transfer. All right. Uh, well, uh, because you're running out of time, um, you know, I'll give you just one minute for closing <coughs> remark, and uh, maybe you know that is where you take it on. Even as uh, you res you respond to this issue of um, uh, data, um, you know, protection. But one thing should be clear. Um, I know there is companies that are you know operating in Kenya based on you know the whole issue of data. That is fine. The issue at hand here is this company that government is saying this one did not, you know, uh, follow the right procedure. Well, closing remark. My closing remark is that rather than go ahead, run, and ban these guys, mm -hmm. we should have a conversation. We need to look into their technology. We need to have our cybersecurity experts look at the orb. It is hardware. Look at whether it is fallible, whether it is susceptible to hacking or any other kind of inter interference. We need to look at how that encryption is done. We need to see whether it can actually be delinked. If we can reverse engineer it back to our people, if we can be able to track it back to the world account that it was connected to, those accounts are having people's registration, are their names, their uh, mobile phone numbers, and it can be traced back. All right. If they can be able to satisfy the uh, standard of cybersecurity, then then they can continue to work in our jurisdiction. If not, then the regulators should come onto them, see what's going to happen, uh, have conversations with them, and see if they can comply, if they cannot comply, and whether they should be allowed to continue in our jurisdiction. There are still questions, and rather than just slamming it on the door and slamming the table and saying, no, you're not allowed to work in this country, there are opportunities for us to negotiate and find a balance. All right. Well, um, thank you so much, lady and the gentleman. Well, that was uh, Anne Gadirwa, the technology and data privacy lawyer, and of course, Alan Kaikai, Director, Policy and Regulation Blockchain Association of Kenya. Well, your time is much appreciated. Well, that is where we 